Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming by. This talk is going to be about how you really move from a legacy load testing platform like Load Runner to an open source tool and really why you do that. Um, we're observing changes that are happening driven by Agile and DevOps and people come to us and say that my current tooling just really doesn't, can't make that transition. And uh, I want to share some tips about how you can have your own successful transition uh, and let's jump right in. Well, first I got to show you the slide for the lawyers here. Just uh, this is information. I'm not making any warranties or anything. Not a lot to say here. So this is the agenda. I want to walk you through this and give you a sense of what we're going to talk about. This is going to be less than 30 minutes. We'll probably be about 25 minutes or so. And you know, my first point is that legacy tools really created the center of excellence bottleneck. Um, a center of excellence is a place with some very talented people and some uh, very big investments, but by its definition, how it was created and, and how the tools were, it sort of led to a natural bottleneck. And then we look at, well, what's the deal with Agile and DevOps? Well, one of the key issues with Agile and DevOps is your goal is to eliminate handoffs and bottlenecks. So if you have a bottleneck and you're adopting a new methodology that's about not having bottlenecks, clearly you have a problem, right? Uh, and then, so why have open source tools emerged as one of the ways to solve this problem? When we get there, it'll be kind of obvious, but uh, that's what we'll talk in the third section. Is why, why open source tools? Why is, that, why is that filling the gap? And then in the fourth section, we'll talk about what I call the center of excellence 2.0, which is center of excellence uh, doesn't need to go away. I'm not suggesting that the center of excellence is a bad thing and it needs to be eliminated. Far from it. Actually, it just needs to be flipped. So what you need to do is you need to have the center of excellence, instead of being a minder of a queue and, and performer of work, to actually be the provider of the framework where lots of people can do work for themselves. And as a result, this is the democratization we're talking about, is it's spreading it out. And shifting left is really about doing the work earlier on in the process. Uh, and the benefits of shifting left and having uh, testing happen sooner, these are obvious, which is that you find problems more quickly, you resolve them before they're expensive. Right? So how can the center of excellence transform itself, sort of flip itself inside and out to become the provider of this framework? And then lastly, how to get started without reinventing the wheel. In, in DevOps and Agile environments, it's very common for people to sort of um, take a shot at building their own tool set to, to put things together. One of the cool things about a lot of these tools is they are inherently sort of building blocks. Um, and we'll talk about experiences we've had with people who've, who've gone that route and how you can kind of get started without having to reinvent the wheel. So my first point is that legacy tools, really they created the, the center of excellence bottleneck. The you know, legacy tools, most notably Load Runner, Load Runner certainly the vast biggest market share leader in this space, uh, did a lot of really amazing work in the client server era, was really something that we could depend on um, for the client server apps, for kind of beating the daylights out of systems ahead of, uh, proactively. Um, those tools had some aspects to them that is really how we got to where we are today, and let's take a look at how that happened. So the first thing is complexity. So legacy performance testing tools are complex. Complex to set up, complex to use. So because of those things, inherently you need specialists. You need highly trained specialists. So that'll factor into what happens here. Secondly, restrictive licensing. So, you know, Licensing is not a code word for it's expensive. Yes, it's expensive, but actually more importantly, the restrictive nature of the licensing, literally node locking. So if, if you didn't know, a, a, a controller is literally has a license that's node locked to that physical controller box. And if you wanted to, to, if you had more than one project and you wanted to use that controller for more than one project, you literally would have to put that controller on a, on a dolly and wheel it down to the other lab in order to be able to do both kinds of testing, right? So that's pretty restrictive. And what that means is that you have to solve that problem in terms of how you design your performance testing uh, infrastructure. And what that meant was the center of excellence was born, or certainly was elevated. So between the complexity and the restrictive licensing, it just made sense to centralize this function. You're gonna have some highly trained people, you're gonna have some major investments and some licenses. They're scarce. You basically need some center where that stuff gets done. Now, um, that's great uh, in order to have, to reliably have someone who can be in the loop when you need to get performance testing done, but the challenge is that that by its nature means a handoff from the team that's doing the development to the team that's gonna do the testing. And in Waterfall, it sort of made sense, you know, you, you, um, 
you might have, um, you know, you might have, have uh, a pretty good lead time on knowing when you're going to need to do performance testing. And so you open a ticket and say, well, uh, sometime in early December or maybe early January, I'm going to need two weeks of testing. So save me a spot in the lab. And, uh, and that was kind of how things worked. Um, uh, I've talked to a number of companies that actually very well resourced, and their typical lead time for performance testing was two months, 60 days, okay? Which again, in a waterfall, maybe that was okay. But in an environment where you're trying to ship code every two weeks, it doesn't really work, right? So if you have a small number of experts and a scarcity of infrastructure, by definition, you're gonna have a queue. And if you look at this graphic, you know, now serving number 27 and the number coming out of the bottom here is 982. So you, you wouldn't want to walk into a store. Or you, I go to get my glasses at Costco, and, you know, and, and they've got the number up on the wall. And the last thing I want to do is see that there's 15 or 20 or 40 people right ahead of me. Right? Well, likewise, with a scarce resource, you're going to have a queue. No matter how fast and how great your people are and how awesome they are, you're going to have a queue. And as I mentioned, um, you have companies with very large budgets that, that tolerated a 60-day queue. Uh, for this feature, right? So, so performance testing became synonymous with some things. It became synonymous with large investments. It's really expensive. Um, expensive resources, these specialists, you know, job security kind of very specialized people doing the work, um, and these long lead times. And for teams that wanted performance feedback often and quickly, it was an unacceptable bottleneck. They, they're like, okay, this is just not gonna hunt. I need to do something else. So before I talk about what they did, let's just take a second and revisit what is Agile, what is DevOps, what, what are the kind of some of the key concepts we can talk about? One of them is that Agile means, you're, one of the things you're trying to do is you eliminate these bottlenecks and handoffs, right? You don't want to have long wait times. If you look at software, if I have a module that calls out to an interface which has a super long latency, obviously the user experience is going to be bad. Right, if you go to a web page and you say, I want to check in for my flight, and that calls a mainframe, and there's a 30-second delay before the mainframe gets back, that's a, user, that's a user experience problem. You, you wouldn't like it. Well, likewise, in an agile team, you want people to be able to move quickly, and if they have to wait on external resources, it breaks the model. Right? Let's talk about sort of the core principles underlying DevOps for a second. There was a book signing earlier today for, for this book, DevOps Handbook which is you know, a great way, one of several ways to learn a lot more about this movement. You know, Gene Kim was here, Jez Humble, Patrick Dubois, and John Willis have written an amazing sort of consolidation of a lot of information from the DevOps movement. But if you look about it, really there's three key concepts. Flow, which is that you want to be in a situation where stuff moves through quickly. It doesn't spend very much time in one place. Right? And you do this with small batch sizes. So they have an example in there where you're, you've got envelopes that you're, you're uh, stuffing, you're folding paper, putting an envelope, and putting a stamp on it. And if you have 10 of these envelopes and you do, you batch it, you do all, you fold first and then you stuff and then you put stamps on, you, it takes a long time before the first letter pops out. But if you fold, insert, and stamp, three operations, the first one's already out in the world, right? And why do you want that out in the world fast? Well, because of the second point, feedback. So the key here is to actually be able to get feedback quickly both from the end users, or if you're talking about sort of earlier in the development cycle, feedback about finding errors or, or defects. And then there's this notion of swarming them. So you, your goal is not to have a big backlog of bugs, but the moment you have anything wrong, boom, you squash it. Right? So you don't end up with six months of work and three months of backlog of chewing away at the bugs. The goal is to have a team that's always building small incremental changes, and they're cranking stuff out, and when you find a problem, you fix it quickly. Right? And you also want to get that feedback from the customer quickly. So the, the last thing is continuous experimentation. You want an environment where it's safe to, to play with stuff, to mess with stuff, to change things, and try it out and see what happens. And when you learn something, that, that small team, that agile team that's learning something uh, spreads that knowledge throughout the rest of the organization. So local discoveries shared globally. So how, how do you achieve flow in agile? Well, there's really two. It really, if you really simplify it, there's two things. One, multiple small teams working in parallel. If you're a big company, you don't have a giant organization working on one feature. You, have, you break it up into feature teams, and they merge their work, right? But many small teams working in parallel, and again, these teams are designed to be self-contained, to avoid the friction of handoff. So your goal is to have 
the ability to have all these teams working autonomously, doing what they need, and they're not waiting on stuff, right? Less friction means more flow. It's, you know, with some of this stuff just sort of it's self-evident when you stop to, to just look at it, right? So why did open source emerge as the sort of tool of choice in these environments? You know, what, what was it about open source? Well, frankly, self-service, pain-driven, zero friction model. People wanted to get something done. There was a bottleneck and a weight that they couldn't tolerate going to the center of excellence. And so they just went and Googled it, downloaded something, watched a YouTube video, fired up some cloud resources that they needed, and they were off to the races, right? So very, very low friction, very much designed for self-service, and there's an open market of shared uh, knowledge, plugins, design patterns that they could very easily, again, you just Google it, right? And you don't Google it and decide if you can raise a PO to go buy this thing. You Google it and you start using it. So the, the, the entry point, extremely low friction. And you think about it, if you have, if performance engineering is synonymous with the center of excellence and these large investments in people and licenses, then asking your boss to go out and buy something probably not the first thing you want to be doing. And so the sort of this shadow IT, it was mentioned in this morning's keynote, people just went and got open source tools and started using them. They're basically working around the COE, right? Now, and that actually, so democratization is, is really the, the natural remedy to this bottleneck. People spread to the edge and got the work done where they needed to do it. But some things don't come for free with open source, right? There's a gap. So, um, it came with some pretty significant gaps, actually. Provisioning, how do you tell JMeter to go leap up onto the cloud and bring up 100 machines and run a test? Well, you have to figure that out with a lot of scripting and a lot of your own cobbling together, right? How do you get reporting in real time? Well, actually, from JMeter, you don't, right? It doesn't do that, right? Collaboration, how do you share those results easily? Well, you have to build some repository that you somehow move the results into, that you somehow publish, Right? Test management, how do you watch tests over time? How do you make sure you can get back to previous results? And then support, how do you get support for the open source tools? How do you learn new tricks? Well, you can Google it, but if you're on a tight schedule or you're trying to do something that you can't seem to find much uh, support for out in the real world, where do you go for support? So there are some things missing in open source. And these gaps have actually created an opportunity for a new role for the center of excellence. Who do people go to when they need performance testing or performance engineering typically? The COE. Well, in this new world, the COE can be the one that makes these gaps go away. And what if the COE could actually be the facilitator of democratized testing? So that's where we get to this, COE 2.0, facilitating shift left and democratization. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. I'm gonna share just three attributes of, of COE 2.0 transformations we've, we've observed that succeed in shifting testing to the left earlier in the software development life cycle and democratize the access so that the, the uh, performance feedback is quick and, and accessible, and it lays a foundation, frankly, for con continuous performance testing. Because if you're building performance testing as part of your development cycle, being able to use that over and over again, it just, just makes sense. So the first really key point is self-service. Whatever you do, you need to be able to basically hand out logins and API keys and interfaces and let the teams run. Just let them do what they do, right? And to, to, before you sort of imagine what does that really look like and what do I do and is this a framework, is this a bunch of libraries, there's really two simple things you need to address. One is you need a web UI for fast onboarding. People need to be able to go to an address and get everything they need to get started. And they need some place to go to be able to do ad hoc testing that's not automated yet. You know, you want to automate, but before you automate, you need to be able to just do stuff, right? And so a web interface that lets you do that, get reporting instantly, and collaborate, share results easily. And the other thing is you need, kind of owing to this whole shift left and the desire to automate and have developers be at the center of this, is open APIs and command line interfaces, that's CLIs, right, um, for fast automation. And integration without needing a plugin. Plugins are great, a Jenkins plugin's cool, it, it does something, but typically it does sort of a finite thing that's already been thought out. An example in the performance testing space would be I've got a test that I've built, it's somewhere stored already, I want to wake up that server and tell it to run that test. And if the test already exists somewhere, then that, that helps. But if you, for instance, said, well, I've just seen a check-in of four modules of code, and I want to find the right tests for those four modules, and I want to assemble them into a single 
unit of a test and launch the test, well, a plugin generally is not gonna help you with that, right? So you need more flexibility, and that's why open APIs and, and command line interfaces are a great way to, again, unleash the small autonomous teams and get out of their way, okay? Second concept, and this isn't one of those, again, which I'm amazed when I talk to people about how things work, they don't necessarily discover this right away, but then when you talk about it, it it's sort of a no-brainer, which is paralyze everything. The, an entire test takes only as long as its single largest component. So typically, you have a bunch of tests, they run sequentially. People would line up a whole bunch of tests and they're gonna run through their suite of tests. And that means that, that, that you have a long running test window, right? But if you could compress the test cycles down to minutes by running things in parallel, you, you end up in a situation that's more scalable. You can grow the test coverage without lengthening the cycle. So if you're trying to increase your maturity, you're trying to increase from 50% coverage to 70% coverage or whatever, the last thing you wanna do is have it take longer to get the feedback that's an essential part of this process. So by going in parallel and running your tests at the same time, um, you eliminate that. And I, 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 I coined this, I don't know if somebody saw this, you know, the best queue is a queue with just one test in it, right? And what I mean by that is literally the moment you decide that a test should be run, it should start running. It should just start running. Like, you don't queue it up to run tonight. You don't queue it up to run the next time we get a testing window. You know, you're in the development side. You don't have to wait for, like, maintenance interval. You're working in development code, right? So the best queue is a queue with one test in it, and as soon as it's in the queue, it's actually executing, right? So the third idea is to amplify open source. Don't constrain it. And the, you need to provide an execution environment that, you know, amplifies rather than constrains the use of these tools. You want, you want to get to that scalability of the reporting and the collaboration, the integration, but you don't want to make somebody who Googled it, went and got an open source tool, built some tests, they've been running them locally, and now they want to either share it or they want to scale it bigger. You don't want to tell that person, oh, okay, I just need you to refactor a few things. If you could move this over here, or if you could, trans you could convert this into that, then it'll work on my platform that I've gotten for you. Well, that sort of blows the whole idea of enabling these people to sort of self-serve getting out of their way and let them get things done. So um, you get the benefit of the, of the open source uh, innovation and you don't want to put any barriers in the way of them being able to do that, right? So you don't want open source based, you don't want, well, it sort of uses open source or it can import open source. You want to actually um, be able to just use it. So, which leads me to, to my point about getting started without reinventing the wheel. So if you embrace this new reality, you, say, you get it, shifting left is great, Having, you know, instead of having 10 times bigger COE, you have a small COE that enables 10 times as many people to do testing or 100 times as many, that, that's great. Well, uh, I've seen this kind of tooling exercise. We've built this and we built that and we, we've got all sorts of stuff we built. Should I, should I dedicate resources to building what you're talking about here, that, to, to, to build a framework that will run these open source tests? And at BlazeMeter, we have, a, we have really a mix. There's two kinds of customers who come to us. One is a customer who comes to us because they don't want to build their own. And the other kind of customer is somebody who comes to us because they've built their own. Right, and why do they come to us then? Because it's hard, it takes a while, it's a minimally, minimally viable product and it's, it needs maintenance. And they realize, hey, do I want to be, you know, do you want to be working on the pipeline or do you want to be working on pushing stuff through the pipeline? Right, it really comes down to where are you going to put your resources? And so uh, we get both kinds of customers, but obviously I would recommend that instead of uh, building your own and then coming to us, that you consider, consider coming to us or at least evaluating us. So the, here's why you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we've already built a platform that facilitates self-service, lets you run tests in parallel, and amplifies open source tools. That's really one very simple way to talk about what BlazeMeter is. Um, I don't usually read slides word for word, but I'll stop for a second here and, and do this one. You know, BlazeMeter is a next generation SaaS and on-premise continuous application performance testing solution designed to help DevOps and Agile teams begin web, mobile, microservices, and API testing early in the software del uh, delivery lifecycle, and then reuse these tests all the way through to production. Right, so shift left is earlier in the cycle, shift right is don't just do it in a pre-deployment, uh, pre but do it actually in production as well. Right? And using the same assets over and over again is nice and handy. So let's break it down a little bit. 
uh, Blaze Meter is pure SaaS. There's, there, you literally just point a browser to blazemeter.com, and even now that we're part of CA, it's still blazemeter.com. Point a browser there and get started. If you don't have an account, point a browser there, click the button that says get started. Well, that's interesting. Gentlemen in the back, we, uh, we seem to have switched. We'll get that fixed. Hey, we're back, okay. So, so um, you know, point a browser there, click on the get started button, give us your email address and basically nothing else, and jump in and use a free account to get started, and then figure out what you need commercially from us after you've gotten oriented, right? 100% um, open source compatibility. We call this load and go, so we take this really, really seriously, which is that if you've got a JMeter test, for instance, that works, and it's got a CSV file for data, and it's got some plugins that it's using, you should be able to literally just drag that onto the web interface, drop it, move a slider over that says, I need this much load, and click go, and it should just happen. Not, oh, your file is not compatible, or you have to reformat something. It's just literally load and go, right? And then we can deliver load from the public cloud, from virtual, private virtual clouds, and you know, why private virtual cloud, or virtual private cloud, excuse me? Uh, Amazon VPC being one example, it's actually the development lab of the future. So many people are doing their dev labs in a private cloud. It's like having a, a firewall, or it has a firewall, and it's, you might need a VPN to get in, but it's a secure separate place in the cloud where your dev lab runs. So what used to be behind the firewall is also now virtual private cloud, right? And then we, we support behind the firewall. And you know, we're a SaaS solution, so how do we do that? It's pretty straightforward, we have a Docker-based agent which you can drop on any machine. It then phones home, making out, outbound connections only from your network, finds out if there's work to do, and runs tests. Right? And so it's not, a, it's not a heavyweight thing, and it doesn't require piercing the firewall inbound. It literally phones home after you, after you set it up, and periodically it looks for work. So massively scalable. What's really cool is you can actually use the same tooling all the way from the developer's desktop running locally right there on the developer's desktop to a development lab, to an integration lab, and then all the way out to an external sort of outside-in infrastructure readiness test with millions of users, all with the same solution, right? The, the scalability is really limited by whatever your needs are. So, uh, uh, and why would you do, by the way, why would you do this outside-in really big testing? Uh, you don't have to be a retail site that's waiting for Black Friday, although they do this. But, if your solution uses a content delivery network as part of what it does, or if your solution has an SSL accelerator in the infrastructure, or your solution has a, a firewall, obviously, and load balancers, that typically doesn't get tested in development, right? But when, you're, when you wanna make sure that your production environment is good, and maybe you're switching over to a different production environment, you actually wanna hit it from the outside like users would and prove that it works. So all the way from, I would just wanna hit an API with a very simple command and look for the response to, I need an end-to-end, -end, you know, full user experience test. We can do it in one platform. And then finally, uh, we have a, a, an orchestration framework, uh, a domain-specific language and a command line interface called Taurus. And the reason why we created Taurus was to, was to create a, uh, a streamlined and consistent way, again, to work from the, from the developer's desktop all the way up to the cloud. You can use Taurus to control open source tools, and, and orchestrate your testing, uh, and uh, it's actually freely available. It's an open source thing. The aspects of it that work with our commercial solution are obviously commercial. So that was a lot of detail, but I want to kind of step back and just look at a really simple graphic to explain who are we? What is BlazeMeter? What, why, why did CA, for instance, recently decide to acquire BlazeMeter as part of the continuous delivery uh, solution? And this is a graph of interest in the DevOps keyword over time on Google. So if you look back here between 2010 and 2011, 2012, interest went from tiny to growing quickly. And then it sort of took off. And that red arrow is where we were founded. So BlazeMeter has only ever existed in the DevOps era. Like we were born with the DevOps movement and we've always had a vision, a very clear vision of democratization, of speed and automation. Make it really easy. Like I sometimes explain this to people, you know, our solution is such that you could have a few too many beers, go home, fire up a browser, and run your first test within 15 minutes, not need six weeks of training to become an you know, apprentice in 
doing something, right? It's been designed to be really, really, really easy, but it's also been designed to be easily automated, easily spread. And other solutions will actually, you go to anybody's website that has a performance testing tool and you'll find mentions of Agile and DevOps and shift left, They'll, I guarantee you that will be there. But it's actually in our DNA, not just our latest marketing campaign, right? So that's really kind of one way to look at it. This has been built from the ground up to do this and to be you know, lightweight when you need it to be lightweight, to be fully featured when you need it to be fully featured, and to be very easy to move along that continuum and give the tool to anybody with really very short notice, and you're up and running. So that's what I had to share with you today. Um, I, uh, I have a few minutes here where we could do questions. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, if you wouldn't mind, come up to the mic, uh, and uh, we can kind of go from there. Any brave souls? No? Okay, well, thank you for your time. I hope that's helpful. In the back of the room here, we actually have uh, some pods where we're demoing Blaze Meter. You're welcome to come by and get a free account there, get a demo, whatever. Um, the, there's also other related booths right next to you, just over your shoulder here. Um, and then if you want, there's a mural on the wall there you can color in where it already has Blaze Meter. Thanks for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>